Hello, this is Professor Kitch. Welcome to this webcast, which is the first of two on section 10.5. This webcast covers the consolidation lab test. After this webcast, you should be able to describe the consolidation test, explain why we generally use a semi-log plot of strain versus the log of effective stress as a stress strain curve for soils, rather than the arithmetic stress strain curve used for nearly all other materials. Once you have a strain versus log sigma prime curve, you should be able to identify the recompression curve, the virgin curve, and the rebound curve. You need to be able to derive the relationship between strain and change in void ratio and explain why we can plot consolidation data as either strain or void ratio versus the log of effective stress. You should be able to define the pre-consolidation stress and explain why we always see one in our laboratory data. And finally, you should be able to perform Casagrande's method to estimate the pre-consolidation stress from lab data. We discussed the basic consolidation process in the previous section. Specifically, we discussed how a change in total stress immediately generates an excess pore pressure, and as that excess pore pressure dissipates, the soil consolidates and the stress is transferred from pore pressure to the soil skeleton in the form of effective stress. Now we're starting sections that will allow you to compute the magnitude of consolidation settlement. In understanding the magnitude of consolidation settlement, it helps to start off by looking at the one-dimensional consolidation test. In the field, if we have a compressible layer, shown here with a thickness of H0, and the layer is covered by a wide area of fill, we'll have one-dimensional consolidation and experience a consolidation settlement of delta C. To understand what's happening in the field, we can take a sample of soil from location A and transport it to the lab. We put the specimen from the sample in a device that allows for only one-dimensional consolidation. We can then place a load P on the specimen and it will consolidate one-dimensionally. If we measure what happens in the lab, we should be able to use that data to predict the field settlement. This is called the one-dimensional consolidation test or the odometer test. There are two main types of consolidometers, the floating ring and the fixed ring. The only one we'll discuss here is the floating ring consolidometer, which is the most common type. In the center is a short cylindrical soil specimen about the size and shape of a hockey puck. It's usually about three quarters to one inch thick and three to four inches in diameter. The specimen is contained in a confining ring which is made of metal, is very stiff compared to the specimen, and therefore prevents any lateral strain, thereby ensuring that we have a one-dimensional consolidation test. There are porous stones placed on the top and the bottom of the specimen to allow drainage of pore water out of the specimen. With porous stones on the top and bottom, the water can drain out from the center of the specimen in both directions. A loading cap is placed on top to distribute the applied forces over the entire area of the specimen, and a digital dial gauge or other measuring device is used to determine the vertical displacement. We place the load P on top of the specimen, and the loading cap distributes the load evenly over the specimen. The final effective stress that is applied is P over A minus the pore pressure U. Since the specimen is so thin, the average height of pressure is an inch or less, so we can assume that the pore pressure is zero and the final effective stress is just P over A. When the load P is placed on the cap, the soil starts to consolidate and we measure the vertical displacement delta Z versus time. When the sample is finished consolidating, we can measure the final vertical displacement delta ZF. We can then compute the vertical strain as a change in height over the initial height, or delta Z over H0. We can then incrementally increase the vertical stress several times, measuring the vertical deflection with each load. From the data measured from each load increment, we can create a table of vertical effective stress versus vertical strain. Once we have our table of strain versus effective stress, we can plot a stress strain curve for our soil. You're probably used to seeing such data plotted as stress versus strain, but in geotechnical engineering, we generally plot the data as strain versus stress. We also generally plot stress increasing downward because when soils compress, they move down. 
As you can see from the curve shown, soil stress strain behavior is highly nonlinear. The portion of the curve from A to B to C is the initial loading curve for the soil. Notice that the amount of strain from 0 to 200 is more than the amount from 2 to 400, which is more than the amount from 400 to 600. This indicates that the soil is always getting stiffer as it consolidates. This makes sense. As the soil consolidates, the soil particles get more and more tightly packed, and as a result, the soil skeleton gets stiffer and stiffer. Interestingly, if we plot the strain versus the log of effective stress, the stress strain curve becomes much simpler as shown on the right. In the semi-log space, the curve is very close to being composed of three straight lines. We call the portion of the curve from the beginning of the plot to the first break, from A to B, the recompression curve. The next portion of the curve, from a bit past B to C, is called the virgin curve, and the final portion, which occurs during unloading of the specimen, is called the rebound curve. It may not be readily apparent, but we can also plot the curves as void ratio as a function of effective stress rather than strain versus effective stress. Notice that the void ratio decreases as the soil consolidates, which makes sense as the void volume decreases as the soil skeleton compresses. The deformation of the soil during consolidation can be expressed as either strain or change in void ratio. Let's use our phase diagram to determine the relationship between void ratio change and strain. On the left, we have our initial conditions. For convenience, we'll assume the volume of voids is equal to one unit. Recalling that the void ratio is equal to the volume of voids divided by the volume of solids, when the volume of solids is equal to one, the volume of the voids will simply be equal to the void ratio E. In this case, it will be E naught, the initial void ratio. Now after loading and consolidation, there will be a change in the volume of the soil, and all of that change will be in the void space, and therefore the change in volume will be equal to delta E. If our soil is in one-dimensional compression, then the change in void ratio must come only from vertical compression. Therefore, we can write that the vertical strain, epsilon Z, will be equal to the change in length of our soil element over the original length, or delta L over L naught. If we look at the initial phase diagram on the left, we'll see that the original length of the element is 1 plus E naught. And from the phase diagram on the right, we'll see that the change in length is delta E. Therefore, the vertical strain, epsilon Z, is equal to delta E over 1 plus E naught. That's why we can plot our consolidation curve either as strain versus log sigma prime or void ratio versus log sigma prime. Epsilon Z and delta E are directly proportional to one another, and the proportionality constant is 1 over 1 plus E naught. So let's look at how the stress strain curve for soils gets its characteristic shape in semi log space. To do this, let's go back a few hundred thousand years, just a few minutes in geologic time, and consider a point A just below the bottom of a Pleistocene ocean during a depositional period. At this point, the soil is under some very small effective stress, shown as point 1 on our semi-log stress strain curve. As the deposition continues, the effective stress increases, the soil point at A consolidates, and undergoes strain. On our strain versus log effective stress plot, it travels along a line from point 1 to point 2. If the deposition continued, the stress path of the soil would continue down the dotted line. However, it doesn't. The deposition at this location stops, and we enter the Holocene epoch. Neanderthals go extinct. Homo sapiens get bigger brains. The Stone Age gives way to the Bronze Age, then the Iron Age. Finally, the Industrial Revolution happens along, and we start spewing billions of tons of CO2 and other pollutants into the atmosphere. An English teacher, a history teacher, and a writer open a coffee house in Seattle featuring a two-tailed mermaid in their logo. Three decades later, Barista turned Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz shows up at the empty lot above point A and decides to build yet another Starbucks because the nearest one is over 200 feet away. Schultz hires your geotech firm to do a site investigation. Having read about the Kansai airport and knowing that settlement might be an issue, you make a boring at the site 
and take an undisturbed sample back to the lab. In the process of taking the sample, the soil is unloaded and it follows the stress path from point 2 to point 3. Notice that the soil does not travel back along the original compression line from point 1 to point 2. This is because the soil is not elastic and undergoes unrecoverable plastic strain during consolidation. So in unloading, it's stiffer than in loading. Now we take a specimen from our field sample and place it in a consolidometer and perform a 1D consolidation test. During the initial part of this test, the stress path for the soil closely follows the rebound curve from point 3 to 4. But when it gets near the original consolidation curve at point 4, the stress path turns down and follows the original depositional consolidation curve, or virgin curve, to point 5. The consolidation test continues with unloading, during which the soil travels along the rebound curve from point 5 to 6. However, realize that the only information you will have is the laboratory stress strain curve shown here. Due to the plastic strain during consolidation, it will have a recompression curve, a virgin curve, and a rebound curve. And the point where the recompression and the virgin curves meet is a preconsolidation stress, sigma prime c. If we have a high quality specimen and our testing is done very carefully, we'll get a strain versus log effective stress plot with distinct breaks between different segments of the curve, and it will be easy to identify the recompression curve, the virgin curve, and find the preconsolidation stress. However, we don't always have a high quality sample. As samples get more disturbed due to poor sampling techniques or poor handling, the lab test specimen quality is lower and the strain versus log effective stress plots tend to soften and don't show a clear break between recompression and virgin loading. This can make it difficult or impossible to determine the preconsolidation stress accurately. If the specimen is of relatively good quality and tested properly, but doesn't show a distinct preconsolidation point as shown here, we can use the method developed by Casagrande to estimate the preconsolidation stress. The first step in the Casagrande method is to locate the point of maximum curvature on the strain versus log effective stress plot. From this point, you then draw a horizontal line and a line tangent to the lab data curve. You then determine the angle between these two lines and draw a third line bisecting that angle. Next, you go to the lower end of the virgin curve and draw a line tangent to the low end of the curve. Now, locate the point where this extension of the virgin curve intersects the bisector line. That point is the location of the preconsolidation stress. This method is based on Casagrande's considerable experience, but there's no theory behind it. It is, however, a consistent method, and if followed carefully, will ensure some consistency in estimating preconsolidation stress. However, if the specimen is highly disturbed, such as the one shown in red, there is no way of accurately estimating the preconsolidation stress. Schmertmann extended Casagrande's method into a procedure to reconstruct an estimate of the field compression curve from a moderately disturbed laboratory curve. This figure shows a typical lab data curve and the corresponding reconstructed field curve using Schmertmann's method. The procedures are outlined on pages 439 and 440 of your text. It is important to note that the reconstructed field curve lies outside of the measured lab data and therefore constitutes an extrapolation of the lab data. Extrapolation is always a dicey endeavor and the accuracy of curves reconstructed by this method is questionable. The best approach is to get a high quality sample and use good laboratory techniques so you get a lab curve that clearly shows the preconsolidation stress and requires little correction. So let's summarize. Soils have nonlinear stress strain curves and their stiffness increases during consolidation. We generally plot these curves as strain versus the log of effective stress or void ratio versus the log of effective stress. Plotting in this semi-log space makes the curves more linear. On unloading, Soil always exhibits plastic strain and unloads on a curve stiffer than the loading curve. We use the laboratory consolidation test to determine our stress strain curve. Lab tests will always show a recompression and version curve 
because the field sample is unloaded during the sampling process. The point where the recompression and inversion curves meet is the preconsolidation stress, and it represents the greatest effective stress the soil has ever experienced. If we have high quality tests with high quality specimens, we can easily draw tangents to the recompression and inversion curves and locate the preconsolidation stress. When the lab data are moderately disturbed, you should use Casagrande's method as a consistent way to estimate the preconsolidation stress. And finally, we can use Schmertman's method to reconstruct field compression curves for lab tests on disturbed samples. However, it's better to get a high quality sample and generate a high quality lab curve. Eso es todo, amigos.